thank you very much. And also, I would like to thank the organizers as well. <laughs> right now, it's more thanking the one organizer. <laughs> and I mentioned that this is uh, joint work with uh, Dahlia Tahesu. And uh, the topic is, uh, well, decay of correlations. So let me just start a little bit about, uh, well, this is going to be then a general dynamical system. So X is going to be the space with some uh, sigma algebra of measurable sets. Uh, this is my invariant measure. And my dynamics will be denoted by F. And if we speak about uh, rates of mixing, the thing that we want to estimate is, of course, the integral of something like this uh, times. And this would be in the finite measure set, finite measure setting. Um, but you can also ask this question in the infinite measure setting. And then uh, it doesn't make really sense to subtract the, the integrals of V and W. But it's because uh, in the infinite measure setting, the thing here for uh, L1 functions will tend to, tend to zero anyway. So this is rather the question. If you look at this, This will go to zero, but the question is what rate? So maybe this goes with some polynomial rate, and then n to the minus gamma, you want to know what is this n to the minus gamma, and what is there in front, and that is the infinite measure setting. Now, uh, well, for the first one, there are, of course, a lot of results. Uh, especially if you have a Markov structure, then uh, Studying the transfer operator will be very successful. And, uh, but also, if you don't have a Markov structure, then you can try to induce. Maybe first return inducing works, but uh, since Lys and Young, we know that we also can do general return inducing. And it works very well. And of course, it's not just Lai Sang Yong. There are many, many people also in this audience who have worked in this direction, like Stefano, um, the chairman, I know. And, uh, and if you were at the talk yesterday evening by uh, Pacifico, you will have heard more results about this. Uh, well, one thing about these methods, or maybe other methods like co methods, uh, done by Livarani or coupling methods, they tend to give you upper bounds for the decay of correlation. Now, if you're in a setting where you're interested in exponential decay of correlation, like Pacifico yesterday, then upper bounds is uh, where well, you're perfectly happy with just having upper bounds. However, if you you're find yourself, for example, in a setting where you expect polynomial decay of correlation, then just having an upper bound is maybe not entirely satisfactory. So then we're going to ask, uh, is there also a way of getting lower bounds? So is this rate of mixing polynomial really sharp? Or actually, maybe the rate of mixing much sharper than you think, much better than you think. Uh, now, that's where uh, Sarek in 2001, I believe, and Guizel in 2004, but also other papers, where uh, their methods come in. So that is operator renewal theory. And that allows us to look as well uh, at, at upper as well as lower bounds of this particular object. And I would like to add work by Melbourne and Tahesio. And that is in the infinite measure setting. Okay. Uh, but uh, the 
and Wien. Thing about this is that this method, as introduced by Sarek and Guzel, or by Sarek and extended by Guzel, uses first return uh, inducing. And that means that, well, it works perfectly if you already have some Markov structure to start with that you don't lose. Uh, if you don't have a Markov structure, then it's precisely the general return. Okay, so you go to in look at the return map to some subset of your space. If the first return, if, if your system is not Markov, then this first return map will not be Markov either, usually. So you try to reinduce and just keep going until you return at a good time where your branch is really onto and you get a Markov partition. Now, that works here fine. That didn't work here. So that's what I want to talk about. And uh, so the, the plan of the talk is basically, I want to cover three things. A, so this is general conditions using general returns. Finite as well as infinite measure setting. And, um, well, polynomial tails. And now I have to look because I'm forgetting a thing. Um, and yeah, upper and lower bounds. for the mixing. So that is uh, the setup, and I want to uh, hopefully get to some major theorems about this. Secondly, there's a, a natural class of examples. Uh, and these are going to be non-Markov interval maps with in different fixed points. And uh, time permitting uh, remarks on the proof. Okay. So let's try to do the, the setup a bit more carefully. So I have this map on my dynamical space X. Uh, but I, I well, don't have any expansion there, so I want to use some inducing to subset y of x, uh, basically to regain expansion. So these are going to be maps without contracting directions. They might be non-uniformly expanding, but I, I'm not allowed to take any, any hyperbolic contraction. That doesn't work in our setting. So let's say F is going to be this, is Gibbs Markov. And that is to say there exists a Markov partition alpha, such that, well, for every element in this partition, the dynamics is on two. So for every A in alpha is diffio. And uh, I have an invariant measure, F preserves a measure which I call mu zero, and the union of all the partition elements, measure them, uh, is full measure. 
and I have some distortion, which is kind of the other part of Gibbs Markov. So if I look at the potential, this, uh, sorry, um, satisfies uh, the following distortion property to exist as C such that for every A in the partition and for every Y and Y prime, uh, the exponential of PY is less than uh, a constant, the measure of this. And if I compare two of these, then I still have this constant, mu A and theta S. So, uh, okay, so there is a theta in zero, one, such that this holds, and this S is the separation time between Y and Y prime, so it's the number of iterates that I need for Y and Y prime to end up into two different elements of the Markov partition. So you're assuming this? This, this, is, this, is, yeah, this is a setup. Uh, I assume that I have an induced map with these properties. Okay, and then I get to three conditions. And the first one is about the tail of this return map. So this here, let's just use yellow here. This is the general return time. I'm basically assuming not that. I'm showing this thing about the, 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 the uh, potential. Okay. So uh, this is about the tails of phi. And then uh, two different conditions, one for the finite measure case and one for the infinite measure case. Finite. I just want that the measure of the, what we tend to call the big tail, where phi is bigger than n, not equal to n, but bigger than n, is order n to the minus beta, where beta is some number bigger than one. And the infinite condition, so one of the two will be true. Uh, I have this, but then I need to ask a little bit more, and that is going to be n to the minus two beta, where in this case zero, sorry, beta is between a half and one. Okay. Second condition, um, so that is kind of quite new in this setting and that allows us to do general returns in the first place. Uh, well, phi uh, is general return or let's say good return, and let's call tau is the first return. And that means that uh, this induced map is basically a re-inducing over the first return. So if I look at the first return, then this is not enough. I have to take iterates of the first return to reach the good return. And this re-inducing time is going to be a row. So a row is re-induced time. This is just the number of intermediate returns. Yeah, that's it. So I could say that if rho is k, then phi is precisely the kth return, where, OK, then this would be the first return. And k is going to be the kth return to, to, to uh, f. So I need some tail condition on this row, and it looks as follows. Um, let's say that z k j is all the y in my space y, such that phi of y is j, and rho of y is precisely k. Okay. 
And now I want that there exists a constant such that for all n, the following is true. If I measure the, well, let's write it like this. If I sum over all n, all j greater than n, and all k's, k times the measure of this particular set, then this is less or equal than the measure that phi is bigger than n. Okay. And, uh, well, then there's one more technical condition which I think I might as well skip because in all the, only definitely in the example that I want to present, that other kind of slightly constructional assumption is true anyway. So let's just keep to those, these two uh, uh, conditions. Well, let's just say plus a little other assumption, which I call H2. Uh, but then I hope to get to the theorems. Uh, that is a way of interpreting that, and I hope to get to a lemma that makes this a bit more precise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in the examples that I hope to do, I know that uh, if you fix J and let K increase, then these measures of these sets decrease exponentially. They don't decrease exponentially in J, but for a fixed j, they, in, they tend to increase exponentially in k. And I think that is a pretty normal situation. But uh, if you look at this, we don't ask so much dk. OK, theorem. So I have two, one for the finite measure setting and one for the infinite measure setting. And, and you know, since I put it over there anyway, I might as well just write it here. And now I also realize that I need to say something about the observables that V and W, but I first write down the theorems and then I say a bit more about these observables because uh, that class of observables is, is, is important. So in this case, the finite measure case, beta was bigger than one. And that means that if I look at the average of my general return time, that that is going to be a finite number. And in this case, I have the statement that the thing that I want to compute has a leading term one over phi bar sum j bigger than m. times, and now it's going to, oh, first of all, just the integrals This is the leading term, and now we get the error term, uh, which we hope to be of an order of maximum smaller. The maximum of, well, two different norms that we can put on V, namely a scaled theta holder norm and a scaled infinity norm. This I have to multiply by a scaled infinity norm on W and an extra term dn where dn is, takes values depending on beta it's either n to the minus beta if beta is bigger than 2, n minus 2 log 2 if beta equals 2, and n to the minus 2 beta if beta is between 1 and 2. And now for the infinite measure, 
I will use that board over there to explain that. But I forgot to say about the regularity of my observables, and I will in a minute. Uh, invariant measure case, in that case, so beta is between a half and one, and that means that there exists a Q Uh, an integer, which is the smallest j, such that j over j plus 1 is, no, largest j, such that this is still less than beta. And then there are constants, um, which I called d0 up to dq. such that, now in this case, remember, I will not subtract the integrals of d mu of v and w, because it doesn't make any sense. It's rather, I want to find out how fast does this go to zero. And the answer is d0 n to the minus, sorry, beta minus 1 plus d1 n2 beta minus 1. And so you can work down all these powers, these uh, fractional powers of n, up to the power q plus 1 beta minus 1. And this thing you have to multiply by those integrals again. OK. And then there is an arrow term which is of the following type. Uh, and in this case, dn is n to the minus beta minus a half. OK. OK, so I hope I have stated the theorem without any errors. So time to. OK, mu is the invariant measure of the original system. And uh, mu zero is the invariant measure of the induced system. OK. So now the regularity of the observables. V and W. Well, I need to scale in a particular way, or weight them in a particular way. So let's say t tau star is going to be 1 plus the minimum time. And this minimum could be 0, such that fn of y, well, let's say this is of a point x, could be anywhere in the space, belongs to the set that I'm going to induce on. And I also fixing some epsilon bigger than zero. And now I want to say that the weighted infinity norm of W is simply going to be the supremum over all x in the space, W of x times this particular weight, one plus epsilon. So that's the simplest case. And I'm going to do something similar for the theta. The, the, the theta Hulda norm, uh, which in first instance is going to be a semi norm. Uh, so that's going to be the supremum over all elements in my Markov partition. Um, okay. The supremum over zero less than i less than phi. OK. And the supremum over all points in these particular Markov partitions. And then what I want to do is first weigh them. And do that. No, not quite. Fi of A. And then. Tau star is this one has nothing to do with tau. Uh, shall I use another number? Oh, but it's the first time that you come back to 
uh, yes, but I might already start in Y. And in that case, I say this number is one because I add one. Otherwise, it's the first return. Otherwise, it's the first return. Plus one. Okay. And now we get V of, what is it? Of Fi y minus V Fy I prime. So this is a weighted theta seminorm. And to get our true norm, I'm just going to take the seminorm plus the weighted infinity norm. So that's the regularity that I'm uh, imposing. So those theorems on the left board hold for all V and W in the, uh, well, Banach spaces with these norms. Is this because you're doing everything in just general metric spaces, or when you think of the interval, can you simplify this, or is that how it is? Uh, I, well, okay, so I'm going to discuss uh, an interval example. Uh, with a new tool fixed point, and what this basically tells me is that those V and W should decrease to zero at the new tool fixed point, and they do that with a particular rate. And this rate depends on this epsilon, but epsilon could be arbitrary close to zero, and the parameter beta. So it means that uh, the V and the W may be supported on the whole space, but it should go to zero when I go to the indifferent fixed point. So this particular map looks as follows. Uh, it is very much like the Mountville Pomo map. So F alpha of X is going to be X one plus two alpha X alpha if X is in the left half. So here we have this neutral fixed point of a particular order of contact. And also my beta will be one over alpha. And uh, normally we just have a straight branch from zero to one. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make a non-Markov by taking a straight branch from zero to gamma. So this looks like, uh, what would it be? something, 2x minus 1, uh, if x is in half 1, where gamma is some fixed parameter strictly between 0 and 1. And now we have a neutral fixed point with map without marker structure, and for which we expect and can compute that this tail condition, this one, is indeed going to be satisfied. And I'm going to induce to uh, this interval. Y is going to be a half one. Okay. okay. Now, uh, this class has been looked at before by Juan Vienti in a preprint which hasn't appeared yet, but you can find it on the archive. So I don't quite know the year, but in the last year or two. And there they looked at similar results for V in BV. So there they used bounded variation space. Uh, and only for uh, finite measure setting And the support of V and the support 
of W, uh, they are both inside Y. So not this general support. Uh, but the statement is, the, is, is quite the same as this, except of course that you, do, uh, 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 that you use a first return, or that they use a first return inducing scheme. So that gives the following kind of philosophical question that Well, we're estimating this. Uh, the integral W composed of F And now you can ask, uh, am I going to use the first return map and use who and Vienti's results? And what I get is uh, 1 over tau bar, where this is the average of the first return map, uh, times, and now mu tau is going to be the invariant measure of the first return map. They don't. Okay, what, what who and Vienti do, they take first return map on this set Y. And it's not full branch. Which is not full branch, but uh, it's still in, the, or the density of its invariant density is still in this class BV. So uh, that's what they can do in, uh, well, dimension one, times V d mu tau, d mu, what? W d mu tau. Uh, Yeah, plus the error terms, higher order terms. That's what you get from first return. And what you get from general return uh, would be, J should be larger than this. Zero, phi bigger than J. And this is all the same except that I'm, oh, there should be not be tau. Plus higher order terms. And both results are true. And this should be of an order of max magnitude smaller than this. Same here, because otherwise we wouldn't have the lower bounds. This is the leading term. And gives you upper bound as well as lower bounds. So question, are these two things the same? And uh, while the formulas don't look the same, they look similar, but definitely not the same. And definitely those two numbers are not the same. So let's call this one and this two. And, and the lemma to s resolve this mystery, why do we get two formulas that look different, is the following. So lemma, well, of course we scale differently. But that's not the issue because turns out that phi bar is rho bar times tau bar. And rho bar is the average of the reinduced time. And, and now I'm going to look at the crit paper again. If I look at this difference, well, I should put the right, the right scaling in, right? So let's say uh, tau i minus double i. And if you work that out, this is the sum, uh, one over rho bar, uh, mu zero phi greater than j, minus mu tau, tau greater than j. And we hope that this is really so small that the difference between this term and this term is absorbed by the further error terms, okay? Now it turns out that this has a nice formula. Well, maybe that not that nice, but it looks like this. So I'm summing over all k greater than one and integrating over the set where phi is tau k plus one bigger than n. Okay. 
Uh, we, that's different classes of observables. I mean, this is for BV, and this is for the class that I'm erasing at this moment. Uh, but of course, there's a big intersection between the two, right? Yeah. And also for functions in that big intersection, you definitely don't want contradictions. And the mu. This is what they get in their paper. And the bottom is that theorem that is what we get. Mm -hmm. Now you can work it out like this. And in this particular example, you can indeed compute it. And this is indeed, well, if you stare at it a bit longer, I mean, of course, this is a bit cryptic formula, but it means that uh, I'm integrating over the set where phi is bigger than n. And at the same time, phi is the k plus first return. Uh, that this is really a lot smaller than either of those terms. And it's really absorbable in these two. Sure. Okay. Now I can say a few things about the proof, and I think I will. Because uh, how we do we do that? Well, we use definitely a tower method. So uh, so it's going to be a tower. Uh, which I call delta, which is, well, I'm just writing down, but it's quite standard. Uh -huh. And uh, so let me just draw it. Here we have y0, which is y cross 0. And then we get the tower above it. And the tower map just brings you from one level to the next. Tower map I go, going to call F delta. And at some point, you reach a point where you can't go higher, and then you go diffeomorphically to the base. Oops. And, uh, and this map preserves so measure mu delta. And uh, the good return phi on this tower, of course, corresponds to a first return to the base. So there we have a first return, which we would have liked from the start if we could have used Saik and Guzel straight away. But, uh, and here we have the projection to our space x with subset y. And we call this y i. It's just f i of y. And now we get the problem that if I lift this set y, I don't only get the base. I get definitely more. So let's use some color. We get this, and maybe part here, and maybe part here, and maybe part here. And this part I want to call And then uh, we use the ingredients of operator renewal theory. And I'm just going to write down some, some operators. And and comment on them. So we have the uh, uh, associated to the tower map and the invariant measure of the tower map. And we're going to build a power series using this. L of z is the sum over all n greater than 0, the nth iterate of this power series, uh, of this operator times z to the n. 
<coughs> and uh, we also use operators which are uh, associated to a return to the base. So T is going to be uh, the uh, indicator function of the base times the nth iterate of my uh, transfer operator. Uh, but only starting at the base, so this is this, and you form the power series in the same way. So this is the uh, transfer operator that is associated to all the points that start in the base and after n steps are back in the base. They could have been in the base in between, but at step n, at iterate n, I want them in the base. And we get the first return, and then we do the same thing. But here, we not just start in the base, we also restrict to the set where the return map, return time is n. So if you look at this, and rz is the sum of all these operators. Uh, then this is associated to when I return at time n, but really for the first time. No, not in between. And then uh, there is this standard uh, relation, this renewal equation, that allows you to associate this um, power series to this. Now if I knew that uh, this was the first return. Then I could simply say, well, these things are the same. And that is if uh, phi was first return and the supports of V and W are both inside this, this set that I induce on. Uh, but that's not the situation that we have. Uh, this is not the case. Uh, so I just need one more board and explain what adjustment we have to make here. And this is basically following uh, techniques in, introduced by Guazel, uh, where we have another set of uh, operators. Well, let's just try to... Uh, explain this just by the picture. Um, okay, let me just write this. So instead of this here, I will have a decomposition of this power series using the same as the core, but some extra power series here and here. Plus this. <laughs> Now, this power series, sorry, let's just do this power series. If I just take any observable, <coughs> V, and I lift it to the tower, it's going to be supported on the whole tower, not just on the base. Now, what this operator B does, it just iterates forward until I hit the tower the first time. And I make a power series out of that, and that is the BZ. Okay, and then I return to Y, zero a number of times, and at a certain point, I'm close to my final iterate n. And in the last steps, well, this, this mass spreads out again, and the operator associated to that is the az. Now, what is the cz? Well, if I have a particular n, fixed n, I might be somewhere in the tower, and in n steps, I don't even re play, uh, return to the base. Now, that is the stuff that I state in C. So then I get this particular relation, which replaces uh, the, the, the standard renewal equation. And then, uh, well, condition H1 and other stuff is allowing us to do estimates on this one, estimates on this one, on their Fourier coefficients, and so on, so that we also com can compute the, 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 the whole uh, operator product. And uh, yeah, that's basically what's behind in trying to estimate 
this because after all the nth coefficients of LZ is precisely an estimate for your nth coefficients of, co of, uh, of uh, correlation. So I think I have now exceeded your patience uh, enough to stop. Thank you very much.